So this is what we're going to do. I'm going to read to you. I'll tell you a little bit about this book, and I'll read to you for about 20, 15 or 20 minutes, and then Rochelle and I will talk, and then you guys can talk, okay? So this book is called The Odd Woman and the City, and it's a kind of collage, which is a style I seem to be most comfortable with. And <coughs> it's composed of about three strands of concern. One is... Um, uh, the backbone of it, all, uh, to begin with, was the story of a friendship of mine, a uh, friendship I've had for 30 years with a man, a gay man, whom I met in feminist and gay politics 30 years ago. We became friends, and our situation, that is, each of us in these politics, and each of us associating with outsider politics, and each of us living alone, um, we felt, I felt, that this friendship was paradigmatic, that it was really... Um, and it, it was like uh, an advertisement for the way we, all, way we all are now. But I couldn't find a real story out of this material. I had this the situation, but I didn't really have a story. And then I, I suddenly started to think about the city, which is all I always think about. And, and, you know, it's an old love of mine, and I'm a New Yorker through and through. And I started to, to think about things that were happening in the street, and I put, found myself putting these two together. So it was about friendship and the city, and myself, and an attempt to bring all that into some relation uh, that has narrative drive. Uh, so, The Odd Woman, the title is, comes from, it's a play on a famous novel by a 19th century, a great Victorian novelist, George Gissing. The book is called The Odd Women, and um, what oh, Gissing's Odd Women was, uh, was every 50 years since the French Revolution, the, f the w women's rights movement raises its ugly little head again, <laughs> and, and every time around, they rename us. So first time around, it's like free women, then it's liberated women, then it's new women, and when we became liberated women <laughs> twice over. Uh, but George Gissing called us the odd women, and I thought he nailed it with that, <laughs> that we were really the odd women. We were the women who couldn't make our peace with the world as it is or with ourselves as the world was telling us who we were. And I read The, uh, the Odd Women every six months for, for many years because I saw myself plain in it. Okay, so that's the meaning of The Odd Woman. The city is self-evident. So, okay, now I'm going to read for a little bit. I'm just going to read all over the place to give you a sense of, of how the book is put together. Okay. Leonard, I call my friend Leonard uh, in this book. Leonard and I are having coffee at a restaurant in Midtown. So I begin, how does your life feel to you these days? Like a chicken bone stuck in my craw, he says. I can't swallow it and I can't cough it up. Right now, I'm trying to just not choke on it. My friend Leonard is a witty, intelligent gay man, sophisticated about his own unhappiness. The sophistication is energizing. Once, a group of us read George Kennan's memoir and met to discuss the book. A civilized and poetic man, said one. A cold warrior riddled with nostalgia, said another. Weak passions, strong ambitions, and a continual sense of himself in the world, said a third. This is the man who has humiliated me my entire life, said Leonard. Leonard's take on Kennan renewed in me the thrill of revisionist history, the domesticated drama of seeing the world each day anew through the eyes of the aggrieved, and reminded me of why we are friends. We share the politics of damage, Leonard and I, an impassioned sense of having been born into preordained social inequity burns brightly in each of us. Our subject is the unlived life. The question for each of us, would we have manufactured the inequity had one not been there ready-made? He is gay, I am the odd woman, for our grievances to make use of. To this question, our friendship is devoted. The question, in fact, defines the friendship, gives it its character and its idiom, and has shed more light on the mysterious nature of ordinary human relations than has any other intimacy I have known. For more than 20 years now, Leonard and I have met once a week for a walk, dinner, and a movie, either in his neighborhood or mine. Except for the two hours in the movie, we hardly ever do anything else but talk. One of us is always saying, let's get tickets for a play, a concert, a reading, but neither of us ever seems able to arrange an evening in advance of the time we are to meet. 
The fact is, ours is the most satisfying conversation either of us has, and we can't bear to give it up even for one week. It's the way we feel about ourselves when we are talking that draws us so strongly to each other. I once had my picture taken by two photographers on the same day. Each likeness was me, definitely me, but to my eyes, the face in one photograph looked broken and faceted, the one in the other of a piece. It's the same with me and Leonard. The self-image each of us projects to the other is the one we carry around in our heads, the one that makes us feel coherent. Why then, one might ask, do we not meet more often than once a week, take in more of the world together, extend each other the comfort of the daily chat? The problem is <clears throat> we both have a penchant for the negative. Whatever the circumstance, for each of us, the glass is perpetually half empty. Either he is registering loss, failure, defeat, or I am. We cannot help ourselves. We would like it to be otherwise, but it is the way life feels to each of us. And the way life feels is inevitably the way life is lived. One night at a party, I fell into a disagreement with a friend of ours who was famous for his debating skills. At first, I responded nervously to his every challenge. But soon, I found my sea legs, and then I stood my ground more successfully than he did. People crowded round me. That was wonderful, they said, wonderful. I turned eagerly to, to Leonard. You were nervous, he said. <laughs> Another time, I went to Florence with my niece. How was it, Leonard asked. The city was lovely, I said. My niece is great. You know it's hard to be with somebody 24 hours a day for eight days. But we traveled well together, walked miles along the Arno. That river is beautiful. That is sad, Leonard said, that you found it irritating to be so much with your niece. A third time, I went to the beach for the weekend. It rained one day, it was sunny another. Again, Leonard asked how it had been. Refreshing, I said. The rain didn't daunt you, he said. I remind myself of what my voice can sound like. My voice forever edged in judgment that also never stops registering the flaw, the absence, the incompleteness. My voice that so often causes Leonard's eyes to flicker and his mouth to tighten. At the end of an evening together, one or the other of us will impulsively suggest that we meet again during the week, but only rarely does the impulse live long enough to be acted upon. We mean it, of course, when we're saying goodbye, want nothing more than to renew the contact immediately. But going up in the elevator to my apartment, I start to feel on my skin the sensory effect of an evening full of irony and negative judgment. Nothing serious, just surface damage. A thousand tiny pinpricks dotting arms, neck, chest. But somewhere within me, in a place I cannot even name, I begin to shrink from the prospect of feeling it again soon. A day passes, then another. I must call Leonard, I say to myself, but repeatedly the hand about to reach for the phone fails to move. He, of course, must be feeling the same, as he doesn't call either. The unacted upon impulse accumulates into a failure of nerve. Failure of nerve hardens into ennui. When the cycle of mixed feeling, failed nerve, and paralyzed will has run its course, the longing to meet again acquires urgency, and the hand reaching for the phone will complete the action. Leonard and I consider ourselves intimates because our cycle takes only a week to complete. Space. Yesterday, I came out of the supermarket at the end of my block, and from the side of my eye registered the beggar who regularly occupies the space in front of the store. A small white guy with a hand perpetually outstretched and a face full of broken blood vessels. I need something to eat, he was whining as usual. That's all I want, something to eat. Anything you can spare, just something to eat. As I passed him, I heard a voice directly behind me say, here, bro, you want something to eat? Here's something to eat. I turned back and saw a short black man with cold eyes standing in front of the beggar, a slice of pizza in his outstretched hand. Oh, man, the beggar pleaded, you know what I... The man's voice went as cold as his eyes. You say you want something to eat. Here's something to eat, he repeated. I bought this for you. Eat it. <laughs> the beggar recoiled visibly. The man standing in front of him turned away and in a motion of deep disgust threw the pizza into a wastebasket. When I got to my building, I couldn't help stopping to tell Jose, the doorman, I had to tell someone, what had just happened. Jose's eyes widened. 
When I finished, he said, Oh, Miss Gornick, I know just what you mean. My father once gave me such a slap for exactly the same thing. Now it was my eyes that widened. We was at a ball game, and a bum asked me for something to eat. So I bought a hot dog and gave it to him. My dad, he whacked me across the face. If you're going to do a thing, he said, do it right. You don't buy someone a hot dog. With that, you're also buying them a soda. <laughs> I still laugh. <have> <laughs> I have always lived in New York, but a good part of my life, I longed for the city the way someone in a small town would, yearning to arrive at the capital. Growing up in the Bronx was like growing up in a village. From earliest adolescence, I knew there was a center of the world and that I was far from it. At the same time, I also knew that it was only a subway ride away, downtown in Manhattan. Manhattan was Araby. At 14, I began taking that subway ride, walking the length and breadth of the island, late in winter, deep in summer. The only difference between me and someone like me from Kansas was that in Kansas, one makes the immigrants' lonely leap once and forever, whereas I made many small trips into the city, going home repeatedly for comfort and reassurance, dullness and delay, before attempting the main chance. Down Broadway, up Lexington, across 57th Street, from river to river, through Greenwich Village, Chelsea, the Lower East Side, plunging down to Wall Street, climbing up to Columbia. I walked these streets for years, excited and expectant, going home each night to the Bronx where I waited for life to begin. The way I saw it, the west side was one long rectangle of apartment houses filled with artists and intellectuals. This richness, mirrored on the east side by money and social standing, made the city glamorous and painfully exciting. I could taste in my mouth world, sheer world. All I had to do was get old enough and New York would be mine. As children, my friends and I would roam the, the streets of the neighborhood, advancing out as we got older, section by section, until we were little girls trekking across the Bronx as though on a mission to the interior. We used the streets the way children growing up in the country use fields and rivers, mountains and caves to place ourselves on the map of our world. We walked by the hour. By the time we were 12, we knew instantly when the speech or appearance of anyone coming toward us was the slightest bit off. If a man approached and said, how you doing girls? You girls live around here? We knew. If a woman wasn't walking purposefully toward the shopping street, we knew. We knew also that it excited us to know when something odd happened, and it didn't take much for us to consider something odd, our sense of the norm was strict. We analyzed it for hours afterward. A high school friend introduced me to the streets of Upper Manhattan. Here, so many languages and such striking peculiarities in appearance, men in beards, women in black and silver. These were people I could see weren't working class, but what class were they? And then there was the hawking in the street. In the Bronx, a lone fruit and vegetable man might call out, Mrs., fresh tomatoes today. But here, people on the sidewalk were selling watches, radios, books, jewelry, in loud, insistent voices. Not only that, but the men and women passing by got into it with them. How long will that watch work? Till I get to the end of the block? And then, I know the guy who wrote that book. It isn't worth a dollar. <laughs> then, where'd you get that radio? The cops will be at my door in the morning, right? So much stir and animation. People who were strangers talking at one another, making one another laugh, cry out, crinkle up with pleasure, flash with anger. It was the boldness of gesture and expression everywhere that so captivated us. The stylish flirtation, the savvy exchange, people sparking witty, exuberant responses in one another, in themselves. In college, another friend walked me down West End Avenue. I'd never seen a street as wide and stately as this one, with doormen standing in front of apartment houses of imposing height that lined the avenue for a mile and a half. My friend told me that in these great stone buildings lived musicians and writers, scientists, emigres, dancers, philosophers. Very soon, no trip downtown was complete without a walk on West End from 107th Street to 72nd. For me, the avenue became emblematic. To live here would mean I had arrived. I was a bit confused about whether I'd be the resident artist intellectual or be married to him. I couldn't actually see myself signing the lease. But no matter, one way or another, I'd be in the apartment. <laughs> in summer, we went to the concerts at Lewison Stadium, the great amphitheater on the, on the City College campus. 
It was here that I heard Mozart and Beethoven and Brahms for the first time. These concerts came to an end in the mid-60s, but in the late 50s, sitting on those stone bleacher seats July after July, August after August, I knew, I just knew, that the men and women all around me lived on West End Avenue. <laughs> As the orchestra tuned up and the lights dimmed in the soft, starry night, I could feel the whole intelligent audience moving forward as one, yearning toward the music, toward themselves in the music, as though the concert were an open-air extension of the context of their lives. And I, just as intelligently, I hoped, leaned forward too. But I knew that I was only mimicking the movement. I'd not yet earned the right to love the music as they did. Within a few years, I began to see it was entirely possible that I never would. As I saw myself moving ever further toward the social margin, nothing healed me of a sore and angry heart like a walk through the city. To see in the street the 50 different ways people struggle to remain human, the variety and inventiveness of survival technique, was to feel the pressure relieved, the overflow draining off. I felt in my nerve endings the common refusal to go under. That refusal became company. I was never less alone than alone in the crowded street. Uh, here I found I could imagine myself. Here I thought I am buying time. What a notion, buying time. It was one I shared with Leonard for many years. I grew up and moved downtown, but sure enough, nothing turned out as expected. I went to school, but the degree did not get me an office in Midtown. I married an artist, but we lived on the Lower East Side. I began to write, but nobody read me above 14th Street. For me, the doors to the Golden Company did not open. The glittering enterprise remained at a distance. Space. Every night when I turn the lights out in my 16th floor living room before I go to bed, I experience a shock of pleasure as I see the banks of lighted windows rising to the sky, crowding round me, and feel myself embraced by the anonymous ingathering of city dwellers. This swarm of human hives, also hanging anchored in space, is the New York design offering generic connection. The pleasure it gives soothes beyond all explanation. I'll do one more and that's it. In the drugstore, I run into 90-year-old Vera, a Trotskyist from way back who lives in a fourth floor walk up in my neighborhood and whose voice is always pitched at the level of soapbox urgency. She is waiting for a prescription to be filled and as I haven't seen her in a long while, on impulse, I offer to wait with her. We sit down in two of the three chairs lined up near the prescription counter, me in the middle, Vera on my left, and on my right, a pleasant looking man reading a book. Still living in the same place, I ask? Where am I gonna go, she says, <laughs> loudly enough for a man on the pickup line to turn in our direction. <laughs> but you know, darling, the, sca the stairs keep me strong. And your husband, I say, how's he taking the stairs? Oh, him, she says, he died. <laughs> <laughs> She's still alive. He died. <laughs> I'm so sorry, I murmur. Her hand pushes away the air. It wasn't a good marriage, she announces. Three people on the line turn around. But you know, in the end, it doesn't really matter. I nod my head. I understand. I have to stop laughing at my own jokes. I, I understand. I understand the apartment is empty. One thing I gotta say, she goes on. He was a no good husband, but he was a great lover. I can feel a slight jolt in the body of the man sitting beside me. <laughs> well, that's certainly important, I say. Boy, was it ever. I met him in Detroit during the Second World War. She's, she's 90 here. Uh, we were organizing. In those days, everybody slept with everybody, so I did too. But you wouldn't believe it. And here she lowers her voice dramatically as though she has a secret of some importance to relate. Michelle knows this by heart. Most of the guys I slept with, they were no good in bed. I mean, they were bad, really bad. Now I feel the man on my right stifling a laugh. <laughs> so when you found a good one, Vera shrugs, you held on to him. I know just what you mean, I say. <laughs> do you, darling? Of course I do. You mean they're still bad? <laughs> oh, 
Jane. <laughs> uh, I lost it. Listen to us, I say. Two old women talking about lousy lovers. This time, the man beside me laughs out loud. I turn and take a good long look at him. We're sleeping with the, rain, with the same guys, right? I say to him. Yes, he nods. And with the same ratio of satisfaction. <laughs> For a split second, the three of us look at one another. And then, all at once, we begin to howl. When the howling stops, we are all beaming. Together we have performed, and separately we have been received. Okay? <laughs> so it goes on like that. <laughs> it's, it's just New York. Right. Okay, now we're going to talk a little bit, right? Excuse me, I, I've had an allergy, so my voice isn't so strong. Um, but I have read the book, and I hope you will, and the parts that Vivian read are very much characteristic of the book, um, except that there's some very serious moments also, and um, moments that are very historically resonant also, I think. Um, and one of the questions I thought we'd begin talking about, um, Vivian once said to me, you know, years ago people used to say, I have a novel in me, I have a screenplay in me, and today everyone says, I have a memoir in me. Right. And if you, and Vivian knows from teaching in so many uh, writers' programs, people are all writing, many of them are writing uh -huh. memoirs. So I'm wondering, um, how has that happened? Why has the genre seemed yeah. to change? And um, so two questions, why do you think that's happened more generally, yeah. and how come you ended up with this genre yeah. as your favorite genre, I think? Well, as far as I'm concerned, uh, stumbling on the memoir meant that I had sort of discovered who I was. I mean, that I discovered, as, I, as we have said, when I was a girl, everybody wanted to write a novel. If you thought you were a writer, that's what you were doing. You were writing a novel. That was, that was the, the, the highest art you could attain to. Uh, and I tried to write stories, as like everybody else, but I just couldn't make them work. I could never get them in the door, out the door, you know. Uh, I couldn't, it just lay there like a dead dog. I couldn't bring any of it to life. And, and I became a journalist, and out of that, and a polemical journalist at that, on the barricades for radical feminism, uh, and then out of that, discovering, using myself, it was personal journalism that was <laughs> the style of the time, and I just fell right into it. It seemed a, a natural position for me to occupy. And it taught me the meaning of a point of view, a really powerful point of view. Because, I, I mean, I, wa I was writing, I had an ax to grind, and I was wa writing out of that, but nevertheless that taught you what it meant to look at the world from a, a perspective. And I, I was, it, was, it felt natural to me to do that kind of work. When I got tired of that and I wanted to turn to work that would turn inward rather than outward, I discovered it was, just seemed natural for me to sit down and write. Mama and I, you know, me and Mama, it just seemed natural. Um, now, all, so, and of course I was influenced by the atmosphere. And there were lots of us doing this. The thing about the Village Voice, which was typical of so much, was it was filled with passionate polemicists. Everybody and you, was... And you were a writer. And I was, yeah. yeah. But if only a few of us turned out to be writers, mm -hmm. if you know what I mean. Everybody was testifying a mile a minute and writing all kinds of testimonial uh, journalism. But only a few people walked away from that having become writers. And I was one of them, you know. So, and then it, uh, even further, as I say, it, 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 when I started to write those stories as a, directly as a memoir, I found that whatever storytelling gifts I had came to life. So then I knew who I was uh, as far as, as the whole genre is concerned. Well, that's a big historical question. Um, 
But briefly, I'd say since the end of the Second World War, modernism had begun to run its course. Um, the disembodied voice was no longer nourishing, um, and novels were, as a result, beginning to have less and less life in them. But the need for narrative never dies, so it turned to this, and it's practiced very badly, you know, yeah, very badly. But then again, novels were practiced very badly too. Um, who knows, 50 years from now, what will come of it? Um, but I do think it's from all the years from the end of the Second World War on, of all the testimonials, starting with the Holocaust, starting with the end of the war, and then the liberationist movements with blacks and women and gays all testifying in writing. And, the, and that, that began to feel electric probably for all the wrong reasons. But, but that's the relationship, I think, between the growth of literature and, and social history. Um, one of the things that I'm struck by with Vivian's writing is that it's not confessional, which is, I think, the thing that mars so much of memoirs. And um, you said recently, let me put my glasses on, no. <laughs> in, an, in a public interview with the, at the Paris Review, oh. you said recently that, um, I wrote it down, um, that when you discovered feminism in the early 1970s, that it provided you with a comprehensive explanation of your life, which I think is a, one, a really wonderful way of talking about what that meant to you. And I'm wondering, um, as you were just describing, how you started writing as a, a feminist for the Partisan Review, um, for, the, yeah. uh, for the Village Voice. Um, do you think uh, that's, I mean, I, I, think, I guess what I'm saying is I think that that larger political, social, historical viewpoint has very much resonated in the things you've written, without yeah. it, but without it being polemical. Well, I was teaching myself to be a writer. I knew, I knew early. I learned early through personal journalism that the good stuff was stuff in which people use themselves to write about something beyond themselves mm -hmm. that you, you know, as I say to the students, your feelings are not a subject. And I, of course, was teaching myself that, yeah, they're not. <laughs> I was teaching myself that you know, in writing, uh, always trying to uh, focus on what was the story, what was the story. And I saw so many bad personal journalists in those years, people who lost it completely and would just drift into confession, who would drift into talking about themselves for no reason. So I was on my guard against that very, very early. And I guess that was one of the ways I was teaching myself um, to write. Uh, it is true that feminism has been a powerful influence on me. But so is psychoanalysis. <laughs> After I saw myself historically, then I realized, <laughs> like we all did, how neurotic we were and that we needed help. <laughs> that wasn't going to come from the newspapers or legislation. But actually, it's Chekhov who said, others made me a slave, but I must squeeze the slave out of myself drop by drop. Mm -hmm. And that was up over my desk for many years. <laughs> that is a, a great, end. and I, I took that to heart. Yeah, I really did. Interesting as you're talking about psychoanalysis that you immediately turn to literature, because that's something that's also very much in this book. Um, not only the title, The Odd Woman, yeah. but a number of, um, vignettes where uh, you think about something you've read or you're describing right. um, relationships in books and how I think um, that you use them in the book is very interesting um, in a way of, uh, again, getting beyond the self so it's not just confessional, that there's something larger that's reverberating with your own experience and that you've read something yeah. that helps inform your experience. So even though, as you say, psychoanalysis made a huge difference, um, you immediately think of a, a literary uh, figure. Yes, absolutely, to always. Yeah. From kindergarten on. Yeah. <laughs> right, I'm sure if that's, that's true for probably for half the people in this room. I'm sure it's true for you, too. Yeah. The pieces I chose to insert in the book that were uh, about other writers, mostly, or subjects that other writers were, uh, we could say, better than I did, um, all had to do, though, with the city mm -hmm. or friendship. Though I, I mean, I, 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 I never use them except in, in a way that I felt would just fortify whatever, whatever the subject was. Yes, but always literature, yeah. 
And in fact, I could have lived without psychoanalysis, I could, but not without literature. Right? Yeah. We all feel that, right? Right? <laughs> um, I wanted to talk more directly now about the book. Um, you write, and you, you read something earlier, where you said, no one is more surprised to me than, no one is more surprised than me that I turned out who I am. And the book really captures that feeling of, of surprise. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Um, one of the passages, which I hoped you would read, and maybe I'll read it now, so we can, I want people to hear this, it's so extraordinary, is um, one that appears on, on page 36. You have it? Yep. Yeah. I'm a good interlocutor. I bring the yeah, book. The I best. mark the, the page. <laughs> You'll see um, why I want Vivian to read this, because it really, I think, represents, it starts over here, um, I think oh, the really? sense, yeah, the sense of how difficult, I think for, for yeah. your generation, more than for many of us who are younger, yeah. um, how it was to make a life without a sense of, Role, uh, role models or right, yeah. exemplars or, or imi being imitative lives, how yeah. we grew up to become our parents, yeah. much more than Rochelle, who's 20 years younger than me. Yeah. Uh, really a, a vital generational difference. Okay, I'll so read this. It's piece. a very beautiful passage. It is, actually. It's not that I, I'm such a great writer. It's that my friend Leonard was so brilliant here. This is a long time ago. Leonard and I are sitting in his living room, me in the tall gray velvet chair, he on the brown canvas couch. The other day, I tell him, I was accused of being judgmental. What a laugh, I thought. You should have known me 10 years ago. But you know, I'm tired of apologizing for being judgmental. Why shouldn't I be judgmental? I like being judgmental. <laughs> judgmental is reassuring, absolute certainties. How I have loved them. I want them back again. Can I have them back again? Leonard laughs and drums his fingers restlessly along the wooden armrest of his beautiful couch. Everyone used to seem so grown up, I say. Nobody does anymore. Look at us. 40, 50 years ago, we would have been our parents. Who are we now? Leonard gets up and crosses the room to a closed cabinet, opens it, and takes out a torn package of cigarettes. My eyes follow him in surprise. What are you doing, I say. You stopped smoking. He shrugs and extracts a cigarette from the package. They passed, Leonard says. That's all. Fifty years ago, you entered a closet marked marriage. In the closet was a double set of clothes, so stiff they could stand up by themselves. A woman stepped into a dress called wife, and the man stepped into a suit called husband. And that was it. They disappeared inside the clothes. Today, we don't pass. We're standing here naked. That's all. He strikes a match and holds it to his cigarette. I'm not the right person for this life, I say. Who is, he says, exhaling in my direction. <laughs> that is beautiful. He said it word for word, just like that. All those years ago, it was, it was a brilliant metaphor. And that's exactly right. That's who we were raised to become, and we didn't. Yeah, and, and you no. grew up a free spirit. Uh, yeah, right? <laughs> what a, what a good that did me. Um, <laughs> But it's, I mean, I was so struck by that because it really, I think, for me, to, I would quote that passage as the essence of the book um, of what is it like to, to be naked? Yeah. And what's so interesting, again, given this is a memoir. Exactly right. I just want to yeah. say that is the essence of the book. I tried very hard here to see myself as a member of my generation and to speak not, not for myself, but for what I thought a lot of us were living through. Yeah. And, and that sense, again, of the nakedness without being confessional is what I think is Vivian's great gift. She hates anything good said about her, but forgive me. Um, that it, it really is something that's so difficult to do. And, it's, and the book is filled with this kind of sensitivity um, to this question of, of how do you become who, who you want to be. And there's, there's a couple of other passages I want to refer to as a close reader of Vivian yeah. Gornick. <laughs> um, but that business of knowing that uh, confession, confession, therapy, transcription, that is not to make literature. 
That is not to make a book that lasts. That is, that is, that's why so much of it just goes down the drain. And, you know, it has its moment and never read again, never remembered, never done. There are great, great memoirs um, that go back to the ancients, and every single one of them, uh, I don't know about it, whether it's a gift, but it's certainly a skill that is uh, made very conscious in, in those who, who know. I mean, I know I knew what I was doing. In other words, I knew that I was I was serving something beyond myself. I knew I was serving a story, just as a poet does. Just as a, a poet knows that a poem is not the, a collection of images. A poem is an idea. It's a it's an organizing principle. It's got something mm -hmm. that it wants very badly to say, and see, and the poet is using him him herself to say it. As a memoirist, I feel the same way. And, and this, I want to get back to this, um, the question of how to live without a script, um, how you became, and what it was like to feel that you're the odd, the odd woman. Um, one of the most poignant recurring themes, I think, in the book is the elusiveness of self-knowledge, the mystery of how we become or do not become the person we imagine what we might be. And throughout the book, there's a refrain from the character of Leonard and from Vivian, uh, the persona of Vivian, of so little information. Yeah. Um, to, all throughout. So old and so little information. Yes, right, right. The sense of so old and so little information. This, this right. trying constantly to make, make sense of why you are or why you aren't the way you thought you might be. But another thing that's so amazing about the book, to me, is there were a number of very disturbing and poignant um, portraits of other characters in Vivian's life, or composite characters. And I just want to read some lines I wrote down so you get a sense of, um, well, the expanse of the book, which I think from the, what Vivian read to you, you wouldn't uh, get that necessarily. If I had more time. Yeah, one character named Manny, um, he says to Vivian, one day I realized the anxiety had formed me and that there were no surprises. I'm sorry, after that, yeah. After that, there were no surprises. There's a character named Roger Newman, who Vivian describes as a man of developed sensibility and liberal inclination, made inert by a will bound to a way of life rather than a spirit in consultation with itself. So we're seeing in the book people who aren't able to live in that very diff difficult position of seeing themselves naked. Just like George Eliot kept saying. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody can live the life they were supposed to live. <laughs> yeah, right, right. One, one more that is so striking, um, a, a character named Tomas, and Vivian writes of him, he was one of those people destined almost from birth to remain a stranger to himself. Um, so there's so many, I mean, it's really... You can see I'm a great admirer of the book. There's so many stirring passages, though, that are so um, uh, deep. I mean, they're, they're, they're deep and beautiful. And I know one of the things that you um, wanted to get away from in your writing as a journalist was p polemical writing, the same thing with feminism. And yet you've, you've I mean, I think you've succeeded. Well, yeah, <laughs> but they're, they're certainly there. And actually... Um, these people that you name, they, of all the people in, that, in a life, in a long life, that pass through your, you, why do I choose them? Why did I choose these particular people? Because they resonated to what, whatever it was I was feeling at the moment. So, uh, it, in, um, as a feminist journalist, when I was on the barricades, I saw sexism everywhere. I never went out in the street that I that wasn't immediately damning somebody for being a sexist. If I went to the movies or, or saw a play or read a book or went to dinner, it was always on my mind. I was always seeing that. So it, it became an organizing, an organizing principle for the way I was actually living out my existence. Now, everyone I sat down to dinner with had many other virtues and vices. I could have seen them in 50 different ways, but that was the way I was seeing it. And when I was including these people in this book, it was because they embodied what was already on my mind. And, and you know, so in a way, I was doing what a novelist does, in other words, capturing characters who would be of use to me 
as, as, as the writer of, of this particular piece of work. Um, every one of those people, the Roger Newman, the Tomas, I could describe 50 different ways, you know, but it was my pleasure to, to, to see. Um, they all reminded me of what George Eliot wrote, uh, essentially. Actually, it was Mary Gordon who, who had got off one great line about, Mary, about George Eliot. She said of Middlemarch that the book was profoundly about all those who could never make use of the gifts with which they are born. <laughs> it's a great sentence. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and uh, she, ca she crystallized it. And that's exactly what all that writing is about. So I was my own humble way, to <laughs> making use of all those people. <laughs> I mean, making use, but uh, making use in the way that it, it fulfills the larger theme of the book. I mean, that's why it works as a book, Good. right? That they... Um, they are in the same position that you were just describing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. If we should. That's great. Now let's open it up. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Have we got time? You, you, Annie, you, or you. No, sorry, I was just going to, I'm just oh, going to okay. the mic here. Oh, I see. Encourage people to Yes. Come up. Oh, and c uh, come up. Oh, they're not going to do that, are they? <laughs> they're going to get up and yeah. make, make this long trick? Yeah. It's a small room. Yeah. Go on. I have a question. Okay. You, all right, come up here. And well, I can, I can. Can people hear me? Oh, yes. Okay. Oh, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, how are you? I'm Lonnie from Wisconsin, and uh, here I'm here dog sitting for my son who just got married. But anyway, the reason I, I want to ask you, um, you are obviously a role model for younger women, and I was just wondering if there were women who um, are 20 years older than you are who were role models for you that helped you form who you've become. My role models came from the old left. My, <laughs> Dorothy Day was my, I mean, Rosa Luxemburg, uh, Emma Goldman, these were my role models. No, we didn't have any role models, but I mean, I, I, when I was a child, I wanted to be Amelia Earhart. I wanted to, yeah, or. Oh, no, <laughs> no, no. Well, first of all, um, Betty Friedan was, was, a, was um, <laughs> Uh, she was, she was, um, what can I say? She didn't come out of it very much earlier than I did, you know, and, and the thing is, there's an age difference, but we were all doing feminism at the same time. When I was a girl, there was no Betty Friedan, you know, in other words, she, she was about 10 years older than me. So when I was in my 30s, she was in her 40s, and that's when we all started being feminists, so she couldn't be a role model for me. And besides, she was a very conservative feminist, and uh, I was a hothead very quickly. You know, it was like down with marriage, down with children, down with the whole thing. <laughs> I don't say that anymore, but <laughs> but I used to. And she was appalled by everything I said. So you know. But what's interesting is that I was thinking um, Vivian ended up writing a book about Emma Goldman, and of course there were feminists of the 19th century, which had been uh, lost to lost to, to, to women until the feminist Absolutely. movement. So it's, it's a strange, I mean, it's a strange right. forgetting yeah, um, historically of women who were, you know, against marriage in the 19th century, a form of slavery, a form of prostitution is the way it was uh, thought of. That's right. Um, and saying very radical things that were just really very much yeah. forgotten. Um, so it's we're, true. Yeah. It's hard to think of. We're always rediscovering it as if it were the first time. And it does, it did supply original passion every 50 years, you know, when everybody thought they were just discovering it all for the first time. And then you sit down and start reading history and you realize everything you're saying has been said three times over in the last 150 years. That's the way it worked. Had you read novels, though, like uh, Doris, oh. Doris Lessing's uh, The Golden Notebook before? Absolutely. Yeah. But, you know, when I read, I read Doris Lessing when I was 21 years old. Mm -hmm. And when I was 21 years old, we adored Colette. You see, but not Doris Lessing. Yeah, and yeah. I read the, the Golden Open and I thought, oh, what a bitch she is. She, she's constantly, every man disappoints her. She, she's constantly finding fault with anybody. It was only 20, 10, 15 years later that, or Virginia Woolf, we read Mrs. Dalloway when I was in college. And it was the same thing. We thought how cold she is, how removed. She hasn't got a bit of sensuality in her. Then 15 years later, I'm thinking, she's just trying to save her life. She just, <laughs> yeah. 
Well, it's all she can do to stay alive. Um, so, yeah, of course, Henry James' Portrait of a Lady, Edith Wharton's House of Mirth, we read all of those books and put another construction on them completely, as you know. You, this is a woman who is writing the history of the development of taste in the 19th century. Uh, 18th and 19th century is going to show you how, how taste determines what you see and what you think and what you feel and what you don't. Right? Can't wait for her book to be published. In the Times? Yeah. They had a subtitle or something, and yeah. it's not, it's not, oh. you know, but I'm just oh. wondering if that struck you, like, in terms of the, you're talking about negativity, and I bought the book, and I haven't read it yet, so. I am always being described as disappointed, unsatisfied, edgy, difficult, um, you can go on like that. Uh, what can I tell you? That's how the review is see me. Uh, Yes, I think um, what, there was a run review now I think, by, this Adam, by Adam Kirsch called the, uh, the Incurable World of Vivian Cornick. <laughs> Some terrible thing. I sound diseased. Yeah. What can I tell you? Well, you have that... It hurts. That mattress and the pea. It hurts. I don't like it. The, uh -huh. the mattress and the pea. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. It hurts. You want to hear it hurts. Okay, here. It hurts. It hurts. Yeah, absolutely. I, I always think I'm going to be seen um, uh, in the spirit in which I write, which is not, not to be any of those things, to, to write, to, be, to um, use those things to describe the way life feels. And, um, and I always think that the writing will be good enough so that it will transcend um, any low-level criticism like that, but it doesn't. <laughs> what? I'm laughing now. I'm laughing. Yeah, right. I am laughing. <laughs> yes, of course. Women are much more sympathetic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's hard to be the odd woman. I, I agree with that. Yeah, yeah, but I'm not complaining. I mean, I'm not complaining. Yeah, um, yeah, that's it. It's just all right. I'm I'm the odd woman, and the odd woman occupies an odd space. And they don't know what to do with it. <laughs> now, now. No, it's okay. What's your next question? My next question is: I went last week before and heard Kate Uh huh. Yes. Have you read it? I reviewed that book, and I reviewed it negatively. Did you? Yeah. I, I would be happy to talk to you about it, but most of these people haven't read it and they won't know what we're talking about. Um, I just started it, but I just think it's interesting that you're yeah. kind of writing about this, you know, and she's in her early 40s. She and is. Looking at literary, kind of literary figures. Who yes, she does that too, yeah. The book Spinster is a book written by a 40 year old, 40 odd year old uh, journalist. She uses the word spinster as if to rescue it from its negative connotation and say, um, I have chosen to be unmarried, right? And she says, from my earliest childhood, now she's 40 years old, from my, so I would have been a founding mother for her, right? <laughs> my generation, my generation supposedly would have made her what she is today, but what she says is, I have always been split. Ever since I can remember, it was important to, for uh, not when I would marry, but who I would marry, as if that question is still absolutely at the center of every young girl's life. Um, and um, it was a question of not who, but when, et cetera. Um, and she said, but in fact, I always wanted to be alone. I always wanted to write and read and be, live in solitude. And then what follows, supposedly, is the story of that struggle. But in fact, it is not the story of that struggle. What she does is recount one affair after another, after another, after another, with almost no attention paid to the question of actually living alone and thinking and reading and writing and thinking for herself. 
and I objected to that. There are many, many young women who, for whom that struggle is real, very real, and, and I admire every one of them, everyone that I ever meet, and I meet a lot of them, but I did not admire this for the reasons I've just given, that it's a false claim about the conflict. I admire the conflict a lot, but I, I didn't think that that book did what it said it was going to do. Um, so when I moved to New York from Milwaukee um, for graduate school, I was like, I don't know, 22 or 23, and didn't know anyone in New York. And I was at Columbia, which made it even worse, because you're in classes and people aren't really people. Right. And so I was so lonely. And even though I'm in, you know, and right, right. No, no offense to Columbia, but I, I went for... <laughs> We're just students. It's doing fine with, 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 with whatever We're I think about it, yes. So, but I would go on walks, right, because I didn't know any, and I would say, oh, there's older people, and there's children, and there's like, there's real people, right. and real New York was uh -huh. very much, you know, discovered by me for myself on those walks. But then I was reading, and so that made me really think when I'm reading your book, and again, it's all about walks, and it links in it, the Fierce Attachments also has, of course, lots of walks. Um, how have you, and I was thinking about the city changing, too, and thinking about class changing, and right. how have you, in the walks that you've done in the city over time, and you're in the village, right, so yeah. you've seen a lot of change, yeah. how a little bit about like kind of class changes and what are the opportunities in New York and how, how have those walks changed? Like, do you still see as many working class people on your walks as you did in your neighborhood? And do you have to, I mean, I don't live in Manhattan, I live in Brooklyn and no one who even works at this museum lives in Manhattan anymore. So right. this is a book that's very much about Manhattan and yeah. a striving for yeah. culture and education, but can that still happen in Manhattan and just the reflections well, on that? Yeah. Well, the big change, for me the city never changes. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, it would many, many decades, and it never changes, because I really see the city at eye level. I, for me, it's always the same. I get the same charge out of it. The people, sh uh, the uh, elements shift, but nevertheless, they, they regroup constantly into the crowd. For me, it's the constant crowd. However, one thing that has changed immensely since I was a girl, when I was a girl, the crowd was all white men. <laughs> It really was. You look at movies from the 40s or photographs from the 40s, it's a shock to the system. There is a, a, a very famous photograph, New York City, 1940, Times Square, and they're all looking at the New York Times, a kiosk, and it was 1940, and so the news was, just like in the movies, they were putting up sheets on boards to announce the news. It's unbelievable. It's a sea of hats. All men, not a single woman in it. If you look at a movie like um, The Woman in the Window, you remember the, uh, right, it's a famous noir from the 40s. So The Woman in the Window takes place in what is actually the Century Club now. You're right? it's, yeah, the window, he's looking, the, char the narrator stands there looking at a portrait in the window and then this whole um, stunning adventure unfolds. But when you turn around the corner onto Fifth Avenue, it's all white men coming at you. <laughs> now you take a look at a Woody Allen movie, for instance, and you see the crowd coming, or any movie of now, yeah. and you're shocked out of your wits by color, sex, dogs, cat, everything under the sun. It's an unbelievable kaleidoscope of human beings. And that is, that's a huge change. I don't know if I was a grown woman in the 1940s if I would have been able to walk the streets alone. That's the big change for me. Uh, I mean, I'm very aware of, of that the change has opened the city to me and it's given me the literal physical freedom to not feel frightened or freaked or, you know, endangered or anything. That's been the big thing. The working class, I don't even know what the working class looks like anymore. You know, it's, uh, I don't know who it is or what it is, but whatever it is, it's every color under the sun. And um, they are no more present than every other strand of the population. I mean, the city keeps recharging itself in that sense. And uh, sometimes I'm walking mindlessly up 8th Avenue and I suddenly approach Port Authority and I look up, I'm in the third world. And I think I'm in a third world city. No, nah, keep walking. <laughs> no, <laughs> so there it is, so the hell with it. But it remains the same for me. Except as I wrote somewhere else, when I was young, everything was free, cheap, and safe. 
now everything costs the earth, everything is violent, and everything is, is uh, certainly not safe. <laughs> not cheap, not safe. Yeah, no. But we wouldn't, be, we wouldn't be in it. We, we. Women, gays, blacks, all the underclasses that are now so prevalent uh, would not have a, had a, a place or a voice or anything. So that's the trade-off. Yes. So, so given that change, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the sort of sense of yourself as the odd woman, whether there's been a shift in your own sense of oddness because of the changes that are all around you. Oh, sure, absolutely. Not, not in my sense as an odd woman, but we, well, in that um, my sense of uh, being more uh, an acceptable element in the mix. Yeah, I feel we, we, the odd women, and all, we've had more success historically than ever before. Imagine gays. I mean, Leonard, my friend Leonard, he, what a wretched life he would have had. Not that he hasn't had a wretched life. <laughs> He's managed to have a wretched life, but no. He, <laughs> you know, he called me up the other day, and I told you this. It was so moving. He said, um, I'd like to audition for the part of Leonard. Funny, it's very touching. He made me feel I put the best of him on the page. You, can you imagine how clever that was? Can I audition for the part of Leonard? So anyway, we definitely, I mean, we've had a better shot at it than we ever would have had before. You know, when I was growing up, there were a lot of women like me and they were miserable. <laughs> and in all the worst ways, you know, really trapped. All those Sashas and Mashas. <laughs> My mother, whenever there was one who wasn't married or was divorced or something, I'd say, Ma, um, what, what, why isn't Masha married? And my mother would say, she goes to business, as if that was an explanation. In other words, she was so weird, she, she goes to business. And that was it. There was nothing else to say. But she was a freak among them. And, uh, and we're not freaks anymore. We're still odd, <laughs> but we're not freaks. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Hi. Um, I have uh, two questions. Uh, one is, um, you guys both m use the word confessional about memoirs, and I'm curious what I, I, I didn't know what you meant by that. Oh. Uh, you sort of used it in a negative way. I just yeah, wondered what you meant with that. Well, when I use it that way, I think of it as a kind of self-invasion of privacy. Um, that people, which we are surrounded by often in this culture, um, but that people don't even, these days, necessarily they're not even aware that they're saying something about themselves that might not put them in the light that they might want to be seen in. I mean, I, I, this isn't the same thing, but it's something similar to the experience of, of walking down the street and hearing someone have a fight on the, uh, on the cell phone. And the things yeah. that we're constantly hearing about people without any awareness. And I feel the form of the memoir um, is really one that allows that kind of ex exhibitionism or, or a, a naive, a naive exhibitionism that they're not even aware in the name of truth or in the name of getting at something. And, that it's, and what, what I was saying in contrast to Vivian's work, it's very um, specific to their case so that it never takes on the larger dimensions of the odd woman as a social type. Um, and it, and it's, you, you feel uncomfortable. I mean, that there's something wrong with the writing, as you once mentioned right, to me. Right. If you're reading a book and you're cringing, Vivian once said to me, a, a personal memoir, I once mentioned that to you about something, and you said, well, the writing wasn't good enough. Because if the writing is good enough, you wouldn't be cringing. Right. Right? So it needs to be brought into the level of art or uh, an idea or something more. Did you want to say something yes, else? Yes, absolutely. But I, I would just <laughs> add uh, that what I mean by confessional is, um, let's put it this way, in, in, uh, in fiction or in poetry, a reader 
can sometimes feel that the writer is calling attention to himself or herself, right? You know what I mean by that, right? You, you read sentences and you feel, you can feel the deliberateness with which this was constructed. And you feel the writer calling attention to himself through the prose. And it leaves you cold it, because, it, first of all, it draws you out of the story. And secondly, it feels like a piece of vanity that is not worthy. Confessionalism, to, to, to confess about oneself or, for instance, to write one of these, um, uh, a book uh, like these Mommy Dearest books in which, in which the, the narrator is feeling a victim and is, is, is writing in order to settle scores or to uh, accuse the world of having done them in. It's just like listening to, you know, to a friend who tells you once, oh, my boss is a real jerk, and that's why I lost my job. Okay, you hear that once, but if you hear it twice, three times, four times, you no longer trust the narrator, all right? So it, that is, you, you begin to suspect uh, you know, the obvious. It's the same with what we mean by confessional. It's calling attention to oneself rather than having to, something to say beyond oneself, okay? Okay, good. Um, good question. Um, one of my favorite New York memoirs is by Joyce Johnston. Oh, minor um, characters. Minor characters, yeah. right. And I'm wondering if you overlapped with her orbit at all. Oh, absolutely. Definitely. We were girls, not together, but we were girls at the same time. And we would divide, very much divided, the girls of that uh, time. Joyce was a girl who wanted to be a chick on the scene. You know what I mean? Yeah, and she was, you know, she, she, yeah, she was very much and was very successful at it and wrote a marvelous memoir about it. A million things were happening at the same time. I was so far from that. I mean, I was one of these belligerent, earnest city college girls <laughs> who had a big mouth and uh, <laughs> I was constantly um, um, making trouble rather than, uh, I certainly don't want to be a chick on this. I wouldn't know how. I didn't know how. Yeah. <laughs> so, but yeah, no, she, she, she did it. Yeah. Yeah, I've known Joyce many years. Yeah. yeah. You all know that, that memoir, Minor Characters? It's about how she, it's about her affair with Jack Kerouac. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and, and in the course of that, she describes this whole scene in New York in the late 50s and the early 60s, and which we were all girls who were somehow struggling to do something, become something, not even become something, just understand something, find a place in the world, know something of the world. The idea of getting married and having children and right then and there was just like uh, anathema. It was, uh, you know, but we didn't, know, we, we didn't know what else to do. Um, so we did all the things we did. <laughs> and here we are. <laughs> okay, right? Yeah, you've been great. Thank you. Thank you.